Greetings. Greetings, everyone. It's eight o'clock, and so we'll give our colleagues about five minutes to join us. Again, greetings and welcome to our March monthly call. I'm so excited about this call because I get to come back with some amazing resources that I've picked up um, in a couple of the conferences that I've been to so far. And I'm so ready to share that with you guys. Um, so you already know the drill as you guys come in, please put your name and your uh, association in the chat box. So put your name and the school system you represent in the chat box, or if you don't represent a specific school system, please just put in the parish you uh, support. And remember that all of these calls are recorded. So if you miss something, um, it'll get to, it'll be sent to you. So I got I hope you guys got a chance to view last week's recording. If you missed it, I know a lot of you had to miss last uh, the last call due to other circumstances. So in the invitation that you got for this particular call, there was a link for last week, the last month's call. So we have new people joining us. Go ahead and um, make sure you're adding your name and your school system or the parish that you're serving. It's 8.02, we're gonna get started at 8.05. Again, I'm excited. Um, today is a great day. I am already claiming that for me and you. <laughs> I think a bug is starting here for me, but I'm gonna power through it. I got me some juice, uh, took me some meds, and I'm going to maintain a positive attitude, the best medicine. <laughs> so as you're coming in, we're gonna get started at 8.05. Please add your name and your school system. And if you're not with a specific school system, please add your the parish that you are supporting. Good, I'm seeing some of my friends joining us. Super excited, I see some new faces. So I'll make sure that I reintroduce myself. Let's see here. Again, we're going to get started at 8.05 on the dots. Just want to give our friends and colleagues some time to join us. I have some great resources to share with you guys that I'm super excited. They are going to be embedded in the slide presentation here, so you'll have a chance to go back and visit some of the information that, um, that I learned and I received while I was at the, <coughs> excuse me, the National Summit on Student Absenteeism in Boston, Massachusetts. It was a summit that was held and hosted by Everyday Labs and um, one of the best resources out there in the world, Attendance Works. Uh, and when I tell you there were some amazing presenters and resources that were offered, um, I could not wait to come back because I already have ideas and some of you I'll be reaching out to because um, next year, I really, really, really want us to push more family engagement um, activities from child welfare and attendance side. So if we're really going to go towards moving more restoratively um, and increasing attendance, one of the things that I learned uh, that we all know, but we don't really think about is when it comes to attendance, um, their families have uh, more 
I guess, power and more influence in making sure that they are attending school. So why aren't we using one of our best resources, which is the, which is their families? And in doing so, creating more family engagement opportunities, not only within the different schools, but in systems as a whole and embedding that into our practice. So it's not just these one-off family engagement activities, but more of a family engagement culture that we that we create within our own network as well. So it is actually 8.06. So I'm gonna get ready to start sharing my screen. As new people come in, please make sure you are adding your name in your school system or parish of association in the chat box because we know attendance is very important and we want to keep up with it for us as well. Uh-oh, we have some of our colleagues having issues with logging in. Um, did you guys, did anyone here, you can unmute, have an issue with logging in and have to, and have to redo it? Okay, I see some heads shaking. No, okay. Uh, let me make sure this person has the correct link and we can get started. Also, uh, I do want to remind you uh, that when you, when you, um, if you have any issues or concerns or just need to uh to vent or talk to me um please email me send me three days three times and i will make sure that i set up a time to actually meet with you virtually or over the phone i'm real big on that um it is my my job but also my my privilege to serve you guys as an act as an uh a resource for support so if you have any issues or you have any questions, um, I know um, I had a few truancy officers reach out to me lately, and that's a connection that I actually want us to work on better, making sure the information we're getting and updates we're getting, truancy officers are getting the same information. And I'm not talking about the truancy officers that are working within your school systems, but we also have to be mindful of the truancy officers that are associated with um, the judicial side. Um, point in case I, um, I'm learning that some are still looking at old statutes. And so we need to make sure that our students are not being um, held accountable for things in old statutes. So definitely gonna work on making sure that we, the information you guys are getting um, is the same information they're receiving as well. I'm working on ways of, of creating a better communication pathway for that. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, as I stated, go ahead and um, I'm not too big on you guys having to cut off your cameras. Um, but do so if you know you have a lot of stuff happening in the background, but you know I love seeing your friendly faces, but we do want to make sure we stay on mute. Um, there will be opportunities for you to unmute yourself to add to the dialogue and conversation, um, as well as continue to make sure if you have questions, <coughs> excuse me, don't hold on to those questions. Please put them in the chat box and we'll circle back to answer, um, as well as those that have just joined us, make sure you're adding um, you're adding your name, your association, or your system to the chat box so I can make sure that you're um, being counted as present. Um, today is our March monthly, uh, our April monthly call. I'm super excited to have you guys join me for today. Um, again, make sure you're adding your your name to the chat box. This is a recorded webinar, so please don't fret. If you miss something, you'll be able to go back. 
make sure you stay muted uh, throughout. But again, you'll have an opportunity to unmute yourself and add. And if you're not comfortable with speaking to the mass, uh, feel free to add yourself, add your comments or your questions to the chat box. As well, um, for those that are new, again, I am Shalnika Adams. I am the Louisiana, um, the LDOE liaison for child welfare and attendance. Um, it is my job and privilege to support you guys in the work that you do and making sure that you are um, you have the support you need to make sure kids are coming back to school and doing what it is that they need to do. And of course, supporting families in their efforts to support their students. Um, this webinar, of course, is about supporting students and families in the state of Louisiana. So um, I just wanna make sure that these webinars and professional developments are encouraging and inspiring so that we can pursue what, uh, Dr. Brumley, our superintendent says, a successful Louisiana comeback. So today's agenda includes, of course, we've done our introduction and we're doing our sign in as you guys join us. Um, I'll go over the monthly call and per, uh, call purpose. We have our morning inspiration and an activity. Um, I want to share some information from the National Summit on Student Absenteeism. I'll do a recap on that so you can have um, that information. Uh, we have our introduction of speaker, and the speaker is actually going to talk about something that has been on my heart for a minute that actually contributes to our truancy and chronic absence. So there is the uh, eviction outreach and legal services. We'll have an opportunity for questions and answers if we can. And of course, I have some updates for you guys as well. So our monthly calls consists of um, our focus purpose. And of course, we make sure that you have the location, dates, and times. The focus this year and the theme this year has been enrollment, engagement, and encouragement. We talked about how enroll, it all plays a part in our timeline. So enrollment was basically those, those first couple of months, October, August through October, we focused on enrollment and making sure students were here in schools and engaged. That's one of the reasons why the Louisiana Attendance Alliance was formed because those kids that were no longer, uh, Coming to school, we had attendance specialists go out and look for them for those that actually opted in. In terms of engagement, that was the September through February, we're just engaging students, engaging families, engaging systems on better practices. And right now we're in that home stretch of encouragement. And an encouragement is especially year round, of course, but especially November to the end of the school year, we wanna be encouraging to our families, encouraging, encouraging to our principals. And one of the things that we've, we've worked on is making sure that you guys have tools for encouragement. So um, I put in a request and waiting to send that out to you guys for updated certificates so that these certificates will not have Dr. Brumley's signature and the new Bessie president's signature as well as your signature and your uh, designees from your school system so that you can acknowledge not only perfect attendance, but excellence in attendance. Remember, we sent out a new awards guidance. So there, we're no longer just celebrating perfect attendance, but we're, we have uh, other awards that are being recognized statewide, such as excellence in attendance. Those are the kids that, you know, they had doctor's appointments, life happened, and they made sure they turned in their excuses. So they didn't have unexcused absences. So we wanna recognize the students that were coming to school every day that they could and didn't miss any instructional time. And that's another thing that the guide, guidance shares with you all is that we're not just talking seat time, we're talking instructional time. So if a kid missed school due to COVID, but they actually signed in online. That means they didn't miss any, any instructional time. So we want to make sure that we are validating those efforts. As well as there is a certificate now for improvement in attendance. 
that is being recognized from us. So we want to make sure that you're utilizing that. So as soon as I get the those drafts, the final draft sent over, I'm going to make sure you guys have access to it so that you can provide those awards at your end of the year ceremonies or provide them to your school so that they can hand them out at the end of the year um, programs. The purpose, of course, of these calls is to cultivate a viable network for state CWAs and all state um, attendant stakeholders to discuss evidence-based best practices and offer support amongst colleagues. So remember, this isn't about just me and about what it is that I think you should be doing. Because remember, I already know you guys are the experts. It's about putting the information that we all know together and creating resources that we can all use. Of course, for our location, links will be sent out as they always are. Our meetings are always every first Wednesday of the month unless there is an activity going on. And of course, the time frame is from 8 a.m. to 9.30. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or if there is some type of event that you would like me to acknowledge statewide, please feel free to email me, shelnika, S-H-E-L-N-E-K-A, dot Adams, A-D-A-M-S, at la.gov, with any of your questions or concerns, okay? So go ahead and turn your volume on, uh, up a little because I do want you to hear this morning inspiration. Um, you guys already know that I am huge on restorative practices. As a trainer of trainers, I understand the impact, but not only as a trainer of trainers, as an actual facilitator, implementer, and um, creating my own program that is centered around restorative practices, I am, I want to share and impart that on you because I believe that if we move more restoratively, we're going to create atmospheres, cultures, and climates in our school systems that are more welcoming and engaging and students will come to school like they're supposed to. So let's go ahead and watch this video together. Hi, everybody. I was a classroom teacher for 15 years, and I'm still a teacher at heart. Only now I teach people about restorative practice. And restorative practice offers language, skills, tools to consciously build positive relationships and to manage conflict when it occurs in a healthy way. And I'm going to share one of those tips with you tonight. I have done a lot of research in this area. Um, helping teachers to implement restorative practice in their most challenging classes and with their most challenging students. And the positive outcomes have really inspired my passion and commitment for the work that I now do. I really believe in it as a teacher, as a human being in the world. I feel it has so much to offer us all. And at the heart of the restorative approach are the values, the restorative values, such as empathy and respect. And I will share a time with you where I'm really rocking those values in my classroom. But first, I'm going to tell you a story about a time where I've armored up and disconnected. And this, this example is classroom based, but any of you in the audience that has a teenager in your life might be able to relate to this scenario. It's a Thursday afternoon and I'm tired, a little bit overwhelmed. And one of my lovely students, Lauren, comes in without her homework done. And I jump straight to the attack, you know, given out. And she raised her eyes to heaven. And I say, did you just raise your eyes to heaven? And she says, uh, yeah. And I said, well, we'll see about that after school at half past three. And she said, no, we won't, because I won't be there. And I said, oh, yes, you will. And if you're not there, you'll be in big trouble. And I didn't quite know what the trouble was going to be. <laughs> but I knew I was going to put a lot of effort and energy into finding it, you know. And at the time, I'm the poster girl in my school for restorative practice. And I could hear this voice in my head saying, what are you doing? And I can't help it, you know, I'm just on one and it escalates. The whole class is like that, I go home with a headache. And in that power struggle with Lauren, I've disconnected from my values. I am not trying to connect with Lauren and cultivate empathy. I'm not modeling respect, which isn't something you hustle for, whether you have your homework done or not. It's just a given, because we are. I wasn't promoting accountability, giving Lauren power to be part of the solution. I was just trying to punish her and make her do what I say because I say so. Where are my values there? As a teacher, 
I've always felt that what we know matters, but who we are matters more. And I didn't like who I was that day. I wasn't being my best self. Although I was probably doing the best I could in that moment because calm is a superpower. <laughs> Brené Brown, an empathy researcher, and my very favorite TED talker of all time, by the way, maybe until tonight. But she, she says that calm is a practice, that it's not like we're born, you're a calm person or you're not. Calm people practice two things before they respond. Do you know what they do? They breathe and they ask questions. So the next day, Lauren comes in like this and she sits down, she's looking at me. And if I'm being totally honest, part of me is like, oh, it's on. <laughs> and then I breathe. And I ask myself a very powerful question. And this question has been a great friend to me over the years. It's who do I wanna be in this situation? And of course, I wanna be someone that models and lives my values. What's brilliant about restorative practice is that it offers a scaffold, an explicit language to breathe life into the values. So their values and action, especially helpful in times of challenge when we can easily armor up, disconnect and miss our opportunity for empathy. So I invite Lauren to connect with me by asking and modeling these very six simple questions. And I say, uh, look, Lauren, I just want to discuss what happened yesterday with the homework, okay? And she says, uh, yeah. And I said, at the time, I wasn't thinking, and I went straight to the attack. And since then, I'm thinking, I really could have handled that better. I'm sorry for how I spoke to you. And she said to me straight away, Mr. Grant, I was pure cheeky. <laughs> and I said, look, from your perspective, what happened? And she said, well, I came in, I didn't have my homework done. You went mad at me. And she said, I was a bit cheeky. And I said, OK. I said, look, what were you thinking at the time? And she said, I was thinking, had I done something on you or you didn't like me or something? I've never seen you go on like that before. And I said, no, um, my mom was sick at the time. I said, Lauren, my mom's not well and I'm tired and I think I just probably took it out on you, you know? I said, what are you thinking now? My third question. And she said, you were just having a bad day. I said, I was just having a bad day. I said, look, fourth question, who was affected by that? I said, I know I was very stressed. I said, I took it to the next class. And I was guilty, felt a bit guilty when I went home. I said, how about you? And she said, yeah, I was upset. She said, I was a bit embarrassed. And she said, I was kind of worried about coming here today. I said, I'm sorry, I know. And she said, no, I'm sorry too. And I said, okay, well, look, what could we have done differently? Fifth question. And she said, I said, look, from my perspective, I think I could have calmly said, can I speak to you at the end? I said, how about you? And she said, she said, I could have told you the start. I didn't have my homework done. I said, yeah. Or like you could have done the homework, you know? <laughs> and uh, she's like, oh yeah, yeah. But we had a chat about what happened that the homework wasn't done. And our sixth question, what needs to happen next? And honestly, Lauren and I got on better since that day than ever. It was an opportunity to practice empathy. There's a huge empathy deficit in our culture. And empathy is something that we can teach. It can grow, but you need to cultivate it. And the restorative questions facilitate that. They do two things. They invite us to see each other's perspective, a key ingredient of empathy. And they allow us to feel with one another, which is what empathy is, to feel with others. I now work in schools, in organizations with teachers and students who wish to cultivate a restorative culture. But this is relevant in the classroom, in the boardroom, in the living room, wherever there's people and relationships. So I'd invite you the next time you find yourself maybe in a challenging situation or in, in a difficult conversation to practice calmness, to pause, ask yourself, who do I want to be in this situation? And maybe instead of saying, why is the dishwasher still full? Ask, what happened that the dishwasher is full? Or why are you late? What happened that you're late? Why did you just say that to your sister? What happened that you said that to your sister? Or in my case, what happened that the homework isn't done? And it might just allow us to turn towards one another. People in the workshops and lectures I do often ask me, does restorative practice really work? And what they wanna know usually is does the other person change? And in my example, it might look like success lies in the fact that Lauren chose to work with me the second day. In my own practice, in all my research, there is huge evidence that a restorative approach maximizes the potential for this, but I'd urge you not to look at external outcome as your only lens or measure of success. 
Maya Angelou, my favorite writer, says that success is liking yourself, liking what you do, and liking how you do it. And the truth is, I really like who I am when I'm restorative and being who I want to be in the world. So for me, it always works. Practically speaking, the questions move us from blame and attack to empathy, the heart of difficult conversations. And on a personal note, I believe that spiritually, they move us from fear to love. And this is what I think our lovely world needs, more empathy, more love. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I want to go back to our activity. So as you know, she spoke about restorative practices and these are the restorative questions that are used in restorative practices. So you have the set of questions for those that have caused the harm and those that have been harmed. So as she was sharing in the morning inspiration, because I know we all have those, those days where we're dealing with kids or dealing with families, when we have a lot going on. I know many of you wear different hats. So you are dealing with stressors in a whole nother realm and still have to provide services and support in another different, in, in, in another realm as well. So it's important for us to take a breath and start asking some of these questions. So what happened if a kid, if you're talking with a family and they're letting you know that they're having issues with attendance, asking the question, what happened? Is, is the kid missing buses? frequently or um, did you guys have to move and now you're looking for transportation but trying to stay in the same school system so what happened what were what were you thinking at the time what have you thought about since who has been affected by what you have done in what ways have you been affected and what do you think needs to be done to make things right and questions that you ask those that have been harmed um, what did you think when you realize what had happened, what impact has this incident had on you and others? Um, what has been the hardest thing for you, and what do you think? What do you think needs to be done, or needs to happen to make things right? Then I pose the question to you guys: How can you apply these questions to your practice? I want to share with you how I use these questions when I was in the field. I actually use these as um, supplemental questions to the referral. So if a teacher was going to write a referral for a student, I wanted the teacher to also answer the questions about uh, to those to help those affected, because if the teacher wrote a referral, clearly they were affected by this um, incident. So having the teacher answer those questions with the referral, but also using the when challenging behavior side questions, I use that for the student that the referral was for two reasons. One, it gave the student voice. You know, when we're pulling them out of the class, when we pull them out of the classroom, we have to remind them it's, we're still investigating, but I wanna make sure you're giving me your side of the story. Because sometimes they're sitting there and they're telling their story and we're listening to it, but this is a way we're showing that we're actually going to pay attention to what it is you're saying. I want you to write it out. And if you're dealing with a student, if I was dealing with a student that had a hard time writing, um, I would actually write their answers for them. I'd let them talk it out and I'd write it and I'd say, is this what you wanna say? This helped our administration um, three different ways. One, they got not only a referral, which just tells the offense, but they also have stories of what happened. So the student is telling them what happened and the teacher's telling them what they were thinking when when all of this was transpiring. Two, again, student voice, but now the teacher has a voice as well. Notice how a lot of teachers, when we're trying to implement things and the teachers are looking like another thing, 
Well, now this offers a level of support. So what it allowed me to do was look at the teacher's reaction, read what they what was going on with them. So now we know how to better support this teacher. So this student did an offense that was actually a suspendable offense. It was about reestablishing and reaffirming the relationship of the student and the teacher when that student was going to come back into the class. So I was able to look at the teacher's response to the student. What kind of relationship did this teacher have with this student? And what supports is this teacher going to need when coming back, when coming back, when the student comes back into the classroom? So I want you guys to take a moment to look at these questions. Think about what it is you're doing in your system. How can these questions help you in your practice? And share it in the chat box for me, please. So for me, I said I use it as um, a supplement to my referrals. How would you use them? And let's take about three minutes to share. Oh, that's nice. Thank you for sharing that, Ms. Rebecca Thomas. She said, these are similar to the questions I ask students when they enter the alternative school um, where I'm based. That is absolutely great. So again, when the kids are coming into an alternative school, when you ask these types of questions, you know exactly um, where that student's mindset is and how you can better communicate with them going forward and help them while they're at the alternative school. Um, Let's see, open line of communication, yes. Um, the questions can be used, let's see, the questions can be used in restorative groups, such as students who instigate or participate with fights to resolve conflicts. Absolutely, I use this with uh, some girls that got sent to in-school suspension because the principal started thinking more restoratively. These are kids that had never been in a fight before, didn't even know why they were fighting. And, instead of putting them in out of school suspension, we did in school suspension with group counseling. And these girls were able to answer these questions and talk through their issues. Uh, let's see here. I see how I can tweak them a bit and ask in attendance conferences with parents and students. Exactly. Um, let's see here. I would like to incorporate these questions at our alternative site. Exactly. That's the reason why we do these monthly calls so we can learn from each other and grow together. We can use them to help parents think about and resolve their own attendance challenges. Same question um, we use on our Be Honest form. Oh, I need to see this Be Honest form where the student get, uh, gets to tell his or her side of the story. Great. I think that's good. Again, we wanna make sure students are getting voice because I know some of you guys sit in, um, you actually facilitate a, um, hearings. So wouldn't it be great to see student voice in these, these, these folders that come to their hearings so that you can get a, a, a sense of how you can better support this student, not only the student, this family as well. These questions will give the students a feeling of empowerment, exactly. And also, it, not only empowerment, but accountability as well. So these are great. Um, again, you can. there are several ways that we can apply these to our practice. Um, and I encourage you to do so. Again, it's not just for the students. Um, we can utilize these for ourselves if there's conflict within our own offices conflicts between, you know, director and supervisor. What do you think happened? Because I need to understand your side of the story so we can get on the same page so that we can continue to support these families and students. Yeah. Frequently, we do not think to ask, what are your thoughts since the incident happened? Reflection often brings about change. You are exactly right. Let me tell you. So when I implemented that change while I was in the field, one of the things that I was, I actually love to report was during a specific time frame, 35% of the teachers that were, that were, um, sent an evaluation and polled 
actually stated that when they started writing their answers to these questions, they actually stopped writing the referral because they realized that had this student done this on a different day, I would have just laughed it off and moved on or I would have used it as a teachable moment. But because I came to, I came to school with my mind on something else and I was already agitated, this student just got, you know, they would just got caught at the wrong place, wrong time. So I ended up, as I was writing out my feelings and what happened, I actually changed it up and I didn't need to do this referral at all. Um, someone adds, uh, Ms. Anderson, these questions will allow students to provide insight regarding what happened and why as well as ways to remedy conflict and address situations. Exactly. The, the great thing about this, notice the um, why is not even asked in here. We have, look, it, one of the things I learned um, even before getting into the school system was don't ask a kid why they did anything. When you ask them what happened, you'll get your whys. So I think it's important that we, we definitely utilize these questions so that we can get insight, but not only insight for our sake, so that we can uh, provide proper feedback, especially in the hearings, but also so that we can help students and families walk through their own issues and understand their whys by asking the what's and the how's and the who's. Okay, thank you all for sharing. Um, again, we will reflect back on this on how we can utilize this and I probably will add that uh, questionnaire how I listed it as a questionnaire to go with the referrals. We'll do that in a different session where I'll share with you, which is um, some of you are actually be engaging with piloting in your system the reset program that I started um, a couple of years back, which is restoring every student, every teacher. It's an opportunity through different interventions on reestablishing relationships between students and teachers after a referral is made or utilizing those tools before a referral needs to be made. So we'll share, we'll uh, revisit how we can use these questions in the future as well. So, I wanted to share this with you guys so bad. I couldn't wait till this call happened. I was getting ready to send it in an email, but I was like, you would not understand the enthusiasm. And you think I was just being crazy again um, if I just put it in an email. So I wanted to make sure it was in the presentation so you guys can go back to it and click the links. So while I was in Boston for the National Summit on Student Absenteeism, got a chance to meet and fangirl over some of my favorite people that are in family engagement and the attendance game. So uh, Ms. Heidi Chang, she's actually the uh, one of the founders of Attendance Works, and she was there, and I made sure Louisiana was on the map, and she's waiting for some information from us. Um, also, Dr. Phyllis uh, Jordan, I have her presentation embedded in here, as well as Dr. Karen Mapp's presentation on family engagement. And that's something I said we're definitely going to focus on. And I also put a link in here so you guys can view the recordings of the summit. I got text messages from a few of you guys that were able to join. Thank you for being there. I hope you took good notes. And if you, uh, again, if you weren't able to join, uh, while it was on live stream, I made sure that I got the recordings and they're embedded in here for you guys. So I did want to share here one of the presentations so you can see these are full on presentations for you guys to utilize. And I want you to take some of the information back and share with your uh, with your respective systems. So that, um, Heidi Chang actually did hers on Data Tells the Story, a narrative and how we can change it. and what I'm excited about in introducing our speaker coming forward is one of the things that she, that um, Ms. Chang um, actually shared with us is of course, higher absence is even higher for more vulnerable student populations and exacerbating existing educational in inequities. And so they gave us some information in terms of attendance by income. Those are things that we don't really think about. And of course, one of the things that I'm working on 
so it's available to you guys is making sure that we're paying attention to what chronic absenteeism looks like in terms of learning mode. So if we have kids that are having issues with being predominantly remote, we need to recognize that that student is at risk when we go into full remote mode because you know, we never know what's going to happen. Currently, I'm working with a team to develop um, an attendance guidance for continuous learning. So there's a continuous learning plan that is being developed right now so that we can address with systems, if we have to go into full on remote mode again, what is it that we're going to do? And what should attendance look like is my piece. And what should uh, technology look like for students? We do know that in some areas, you guys are rural, so your, your uh, lower level grades don't always take home a, a, a Chromebook, but they take home packets. And so how are we engaging and making sure that, you know, they're not counted as absent, but they're counted as doing the work and, and what that looks like. So I'm currently working on that. But I just wanted to share with you specifically in this particular presentation. So, you know, when we do, um, when we do add, um, do presentations for our, our systems, these are things that we can fall back on. And like I said, for today, we're going to discuss one of the things that I am, um, I, I think we definitely need to focus on is this right here. One of the barriers to attendance is housing. And of course there's food insecurity, but housing insecurity as well. So again, remember slide eight, slide eight gives you those recordings that we are excited about. You're right, Ms. Williams, I'm excited too. Um, as well as the presentation so that you can view them at your own time. So without further ado, I am super excited to share and introduce our speaker for today. Um, today's presentation is on eviction outreach and legal services. Again, if we're gonna truly say that we're advocates, then we need to make sure we're advocating and we're creating accessible resources for the families and students that we are serving. So today is our, our, our speaker for today is Ms. Letizia Brown. I'm super excited to introduce her today. She's a staff attorney for Southeast uh, Louisiana Legal Services. She's a native of Louisiana and calls Clinton her home for my Clinton folks out there. She attended ULL where she obtained her bachelor's degree in psychology. Um, she advanced with counseling in the counseling field and did therapy um, from Baton Rouge all the way to Houston since 2010. And she's provided therapy within the, the Federal Bureau of Prisons in Beaumont, Texas as a drug abuse treatment specialist. And then she decided to go to Southern University Law Center in 2017, where she graduated with a Juris Doctorate and is now a barred attorney for the state of Louisiana. She continues to work around within the Louisiana communities by her own endeavors through a company um, through her company, the Black Owned Black Firm, and through her employment with Southeast Legal Services. She currently provides services as an eviction, disaster, and family law attorney. Um, through her experience, Ms. Brown has found that each disenfranchised community can narrow its root issues down to education and economics. Therefore, it is her goal to be a resource to the community through her own expertise in counseling and law by providing educational outreach initiatives and to be a connection to the expert, uh, expertise of those in her growing network. She also hopes that through her professional growth, she can aid in the economic growth of Louisiana communities and aid in building more stabilized family structures. I am so excited to let her uh, just share what it is she's going to share with us. I'm not going to blow the whistle because I want her to share how she plans to partner with not just those, uh, not just the department, but how she's going to partner with systems in general. So um, please let's give a warm greeting to Ms. Latija Brown. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Ms. Shonika. I appreciate it all and for allowing me this opportunity uh, to present to you guys today. 
Um, I, again, I work with Southeast Louisiana Legal Services for, since I've been an attorney with Southeast, I've been doing eviction work, helping clients either uh, in representation of them as a, um, as they're going to court or just providing legal advice to them on how to navigate the eviction that they may be facing in the future. And here at Southeast, uh, we provide civil legal aid. Uh, the challenge we have at Southeast is that the constitution guarantees the right to counsel and the constitution provides a right to counsel for only criminal cases. A large number of low income constituents face civil legal problems as well, but they can't afford that. And uh, if, you, if you know anything about the constitution, everyone has a right to, to legal aid for criminal cases. And we know that by the public defender's office. But when someone is facing a civil legal issue, it's hard for them to find the help they need because most of us can't afford it. Uh, at the rates that a lot of attorneys charge for uh, their services, I can't afford them. So I can only imagine the amount of people in Louisiana alone that cannot find an attorney. Because we deal with evictions, we consider evictions a disaster. And when disaster strikes, whether it's a global pandemic, a uh, major natural disaster, or family loss, a family loses their home due to a fire or any other natural disaster, civil aid is, is oftentimes overlooked. We don't think about the fact that people uh, may need, uh, individuals may need an attorney in these types of situations. We face so many of those issues. I cannot count the amount of FEMA issues that arise during hurricane season. We're preparing for that now because as Louisianians, we know hurricane season is upon us. Uh, we're already getting a lot of active weather. Uh, we have uh, more hurricanes than I've ever heard of. I mean, tornadoes, I'm sorry, than I've ever heard of in Louisiana. So when tornadoes come, when heavy weather comes, we've had that multiple times this month, in the last month, folks are looking for legal aid. They face a lot of issues. Um, and we are here to simply try to stabilize those families. People end up in so many different places. And we know from the Hurricane uh, Ida, how many people ended up in uh, Houston and other various areas. And what we do, once again, we provide that, we provide that civil legal counseling for those areas. And listed uh, are the areas that we, for the most part, provide. That's not the totality of the services that we provide, but we do provide consumer issue, consumer law. Uh, representation and that deals with anything from shopping and you face some issue when you purchase something. I know I had a, a lady call recently, she purchased a bed and the bed didn't work out uh, in her favor and she was having issues trying to return the bed because something was wrong with it. And the company that she purchased it from was refusing to re refund it. And that's something that comes to us. We get a lot of education issues where individuals are coming to us because their child was expelled or expended, uh, suspended, and they don't think it was fair. We get a lot of unemployment issues, other employment issues when it comes to wages, if an individual isn't paid the wages that they believe they're supposed to have. Of course, we get family law issues, custodies and divorces, juvenile cases usually is gonna deal with suspensions and ex expulsions, healthcare, we deal with Medicaid and a lot of other, um, Social Security issues when it comes down to taking care of health care, housing, of course. I spoke about the evictions, secessions. Uh, I can go in depth about that. Uh, that's a passion of mine as well. Income maintenance, individual rights, and other miscellaneous issues. The population we serve is normally going to be low-income individuals. Uh, they have to be in that, um, that median area. And like I stated before, um, we do end up having people who are excluded even for us because with income, there are people in between that range of low income where they make too, money, too much money to qualify for our program, but they can't pay that cost of those attorneys. So it's hard sometimes to turn those individuals away. And so what I'm here today to talk about is the truancy issues that are presented because of eviction. Looking at what's presented by Louisiana Believes, I noticed that there is an uptrend in truancy amongst students in Louisiana. 
And I think anybody on this call may uh, be already aware of that. I didn't really want to go into it because I think that's the purpose of why you guys are having this meeting, the purpose of why uh, different organizations exist in Louisiana to try to combat that issue of truancy. It's a national issue. Along with truancy rising, the eviction rate is rising. And in Louisiana, we see a overall 2.65% increase in evictions. And we kind of trend together with the United States, but as you can see, the eviction rate has kind of gone down. Uh, these statistics end in 2015. I'm curious to know what that those statistics are gonna look like since COVID is happening, but we're kind of still ticking up. There was a drop about 2015, but of course, post COVID, there was a mass amount of evictions and I am curious to see what that data is. So we're thinking also if truancy is going up and evictions are also going up, there may be a correlation to those two things. And so truancy across the nation, truant students are often homeless. And once again, this may be something many of you already know, the McKinney-Bento definition of homelessness, they, they define it as homelessness amongst children and youth it means an individual who lacks a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence. And for a lot of truant issues, a lot of truant students and a lot of low income students, this is a common problem because fix, uh, a lack of fixed, regular home does not necessarily mean that they're on the street living in a car or living on a sidewalk or in a shelter. It means that they don't have stable living. And so I wanted to kind of know, because it's, it's, Louisiana doesn't have a whole lot of research that I can find. If anybody has that uh, research, please send it to me. But um, I couldn't find a whole lot of research in Louisiana on their truancy issues or any articles that have been written, journals that have been written about truancy. So I went across the nation trying to look for um, the truancy issue, because I believe it's similar, maybe different issues that are presented per state, but pretty much it's the same issues that I've noticed. And it says, uh, truancy is like a symptom. And the goal is to get at the root cause of truancy. The majority of reasons they're seeing students missing school isn't what's commonly thought. And this is from the Education Committee Chairman, Bob Evans. And he states that committee members Committee members, thank you, were updated Tuesday on this program, and they noted that the biggest reasons are poverty, homelessness, looming evictions, medical, and mental health issues. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe this quote is coming from Kansas. You go to the next slide. And uh, this is coming, oh, this one is out of Kansas, so I'm gonna have to, um, I don't know, I think that one may have been come out of DC then. And it, uh, this one is quoted from Kansas and it's saying that children will bear the brunt of a looming eviction crisis. This is the, after the COVID, this is since COVID. And it's saying that home, housing is everything. Said Melissa Douglas, the liaison for homeless students in Kansas City's public schools districts. Moving from place to place is unwarranted to stress on adults and students. And we know that the more moves kids and families make, the more gaps in their education that they may have. And I'm very much a housing first um, individual. I believe in the housing first model. And housing first model, of course, housing is first. And I've dealt with a lot of homeless individuals throughout my career with counseling. And I've noticed that if a person doesn't have housing, they don't care about anything else. You can try to go and talk to them about getting a job. You can talk to them about your religious beliefs. They don't care. They need housing. They need those. Uh, if anybody is in counseling or has studied anything dealing with psychology, you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we know that shelter is at the top. Shelter, food, protection, that self-actualization, those things are needed. If you're not meeting those needs of an individual, you can't talk to them about anything else. They're not care they don't care about their mental health. They're not taking their medication. Give me my shelter, my food, give me some type of protection, and then we could discuss those other things. And in knowing that uh, if those things aren't met, individuals, kids aren't worried about their grades, if they're worried about where they're gonna lay their heads at night. A lot of students, um, are the adults in their homes and they're taking care of the household. And when the household doesn't exist and they can't, when the home doesn't exist for the household, those students can be stressed. 
And it may be even more stressful for the student than it is for the parent, because of course they have to go to school and face their peers on their, and with them being homeless. And you guys know what comes after being homeless. Are they keeping up with their clothing? Are they keeping up with their, their health? A lot of the issues are presented. And also this is coming from Baltimore and it states that homelessness is a key factor in truancy. During the fiscal year 2010, the Baltimore City's Mayor Office of Human Services identified more than 4,500 school-aged children as homeless. Many of these children come from families who have lost their housing as a result of an eviction or domestic violence. Next. Okay. And so for us here at Southeast Louisiana Legal Services, when I am dealing with a person who is presented with an eviction, I notice that there are some common issues that tenants present. A lot of our tenants, uh, they don't understand their lease. Most of them didn't even read it. And they don't know what they signed up for. They don't understand what they're obligated to. And so sometimes I have to go through their lease to explain to them why uh, these things are happening to them, what they have a right to, and what the landlord has a right to. And so there are things that the landlord is obligated to that a lot of, uh, a lot of our clients don't understand. And one of those is the warranty of um, habitability cannot be waived. So compatibility, uh, hab hab <laughs> goodness, I can't even pronounce it now. Um, habitability <laughs> cannot be waived. And so a lot of the, uh, a lot of clients walk into situations and they, they end up housed in, um, in a, an apartment or a house that is, is uninhabitable. And so they don't understand that you can't waive that. The landlord has an obligation to make their home habitable. And so a lot of people who are low income, they, they are in a low education situation, a low economic situation. They don't have a whole lot of fight in them or a whole lot of understanding to know that I, they can say, you need to fix these things. And, um, and sometimes it'll be the threat of an eviction because of, of, there are some landlords who illegally evict clients that, um, so they, they're in fear of being evicted. So they'll take things that the, the law says they don't have to take. And then they also have a warranty of peaceable possession. And that means that I should be able to, to go inside my home and live there peace, peacefully. I shouldn't have to hear uh, my neighbors arguing next door. I shouldn't have anybody kicking in my door and stealing from me. There are, there are things that you, have, you should be warranted in staying in your home. Even um, it's a warranty that your landlord just can't, he can't, just enter your home for no particular reason. That is also peaceful possession. And that's something that I have to explain to clients a lot of times. They also don't understand, uh, some of them may not understand the eviction process and time delays. A lot of them don't understand that they have, they should get a five day notice uh, to vacate before they are evicted. The issue with that is because a lot of them don't read their leases or they don't understand their leases. They don't know that they've waived that five day notice to vacate. So if any of you are renting, I encourage you not to say that any of you would be evicted. I hope that doesn't happen, but I encourage you to go through your lease and see if you waive your five day notice to vacate. Uh, because a lot of people don't read it. They don't, if they read it, they didn't understand it. They breezed over it or they just was like, oh, it's just another term in my lease that I don't understand. But it's important for those people who may have a potential to be evicted. Also time delays. Uh, they don't know that there's a 72 hour uh, time frame between getting an eviction notice and be appearing in court. And so there are many time delays, even the 24 hour uh, time frame that they have to be out of the unit in the case that they are evicted. So a lot of them don't understand that there's there are time frames that are there and that have to be followed either by the landlord or by the court. And repair and deduct, and this is um, this is law, our civil code article 2694. A lot of clients don't know, and I would tell this to people who are renting as well, that if you go to your landlord and you say, hey, this thing needs to be fixed in my home and that landlord doesn't fix it, the law sketches out how you can go in and repair the things that are broken or in disrepair in your home, replace it, and deduct it from your rent. But there are certain guidelines that you have to follow in order to be able to do that and not be penalized later. And a lot of clients don't know that. A lot of times when they come to me, they have a long list of issues with their apartment or their home. And they're saying, hey, these things haven't been fixed. And one of my questions is, okay, well, did you do these things to maybe deduct them? Because they're, they're with us usually because they're facing eviction. 
my question is, hey, how can we mitigate this issue? And a way to mitigate that issue is to see if they repaired anything in the home, did it the way the law says do it, and then we could deduct it from the rent that they may owe. And then post-conviction rights. Believe it or not, uh, individuals who have been evicted, they have a right to appeal. Well, for our office, we only do the appeals for the cases that we handle, mainly because we have to go back and sift through uh, to see if the client made a mistake in the original proceeding, and that could be kind of hard, and it might be hard to fight. And then, too, because you're only granted 24 hours to appeal. And so, Truancy also across the nation stated, and this is the National Center for Homeless uh, Education at CERB, they stated that missing school is not without effect on student performance. And chronically absent students having lower, having lower standards Chronically absent students having lower standardized test scores and grade point average and higher rates of grade retention and dropping out. So students being evicted, parents who are in uh, low economic situations are more likely to be evicted, which puts the kid in that homeless, unstable situation. And so the effects of that are those low grades that you may see, are the behavioral issues that you may see. They're the dropouts that you may see. And it's not to say that every situation that a kid, a, a child is ex exhibiting those behaviors is experiencing homelessness or an eviction, but I would look into those things uh, to see if that may be a factor before just attributing it to the, the kid is acting up or the child is acting up or the child is uh, not performing at a at as higher level, level as his peers. Because his peers may be in a stable living environment. His peers also may, um, have those supports that are available to them to help them matriculate through school. And so I just wanted to show you guys the statistics since COVID on the issues that our offices are having. We have a Baton Rouge, Covington, Gretna, Hammond, Homer, and New Orleans office. And so for housing since COVID, we have had a 538% increase uh, in housing issues. Uh, Homer has had a 300%. Hammond has had an 860% increase in housing issues. And of course, housing issues can possibly be triggered by employment issues. And as you can see, New Orleans, uh, they didn't put out the, well, we have the statistics for Baton Rouge, but our agency hasn't really put that out to us. But there is a 2,533% increase in unemployment compensation. So I can only imagine what it looks like for, for Baton Rouge and how that has affected the population with housing. You could go to the next slide. How we can partner. So my goal, as Shonika stated in my introduction, is to help mitigate those issues that are presenting in, in our communities. And that's a, with housing and that's with economics, mainly to educate. And I think, in education, some problems are solved, not all of them, but some problems are solved in just the now I know and I can do better. So my goal and uh, the goal of some of my colleagues is to provide educational se sessions to the populations more likely to be affected. So I would like to get out into the community in any way possible to provide educational uh, sessions to parents so they understand how to attack an eviction issue if they were to face it. And also because the higher students, the 11th and 12th graders that are at, in East Baton Rouge schools and East Feliciana schools as well, because like stated, I am from Clinton and the, the surrounding areas, they are gonna be renters. Your, your high school students are gonna be renters. Uh, a lot of them are gonna be signing, will be signing leases in the next six months. And many of them are going to sign leases and not read them. And so my goal is to at the least say, read your lease know what you're signing up for. So that if you are presented with an eviction or even just a simple landlord tenant issue, you know how to approach that issue or you know that we're available. Because even if a client just comes to us and says, hey, I don't understand what this says and they want us to sign it, we will sit and look at that lease with that client and, um, and help that lease with that, with, uh, help that client with the lease. And so also train any um, school staff about legal aid, which is what I'm doing now, and to maybe go into a little more in depth of the services we provide, because it's, we have a variety of services uh, that we provide here at Southeast. And a lot of individuals in Louisiana don't know we exist. So it's to at least say, hey, 
let can I explain to you what we do? So if you have a, a student or a parent that's facing a particular issue, you can refer them to us and we can help those individuals with the legal issues that they're that they're having. And at the very least, just provide you guys with brochures and uh and flyers about Southeast Legal to say, hey, we're here. And if you need us, refer. If you need us yourself, come see us. We're here and we're available to help you. We want to establish a streamline, streamline referral process between the agencies. Hey, if I'm the main contact, I will be the main contact for anyone at your at, at, with East Baton Rouge school system to say, send those individuals to me. If you're having an issue and you have a question, call me. I'm willing to answer that question. But to just streamline it, a lot of individuals don't seek out services because they don't understand how to navigate the system. And I think if we if we lower the steps needed to get that person to the services they need, they're more likely to seek them out. Follow up acts to act to assess family needs. A lot of times I will call clients and just check on them to see how they're doing. Is everything all right? Uh, are you still um, in stable living? Anything else? If it's Social Security, Medicaid, the other attorneys will take their time in uh, following up with clients. Website information, we have a website, slls.org. We have a lot of information there if anyone wants to check out that website. And know your, know your rights, Facebook Lives and other events. We put on a lot of Facebook Lives. We're on Facebook, Southeast Louisiana Legal Services. Uh, we have lives and uh, we do educational sessions there. And we, we're, we're in the community. We, we're, I know there is a senior citizens event that recently passed that we attended as well to just be there as a resource for individuals in our community. And so here is uh, the Louisiana Civil Legal Aid Programs. It's us and it's Acadiana Legal uh, Services Corporate, co Corporation. And so we cover basically um, Southeast Louisiana. And so we're here in Baton Rouge, uh, Greater Baton Rouge and its surrounding areas. We take care of Livingston, Tangipahoa, St. Helena Parish, Ponca Peak, we have um, Jefferson, St. James, Orleans Parishes, all of those, everything in orange, that's us. And then Acadiana Legal Services takes care of everybody in the green. So if someone comes to us and we, I think there was an unemployment um, announcement that went out during COVID. And of course, since we're here in Baton Rouge and the unemployment office is here in Baton Rouge. We got a lot of referrals from uh, Louisiana Workforce Commission from places like Monroe and Shreveport just because that's what they knew. So our goal was just to refer them back to Acadiana Legal Services. There is a few other legal, smaller legal aid services in North Louisiana. We refer them back to those agencies and to help them and they do a wonderful job as well. We can go to the next slide. Okay, and this is just my contact information. That's my email address, lbrown at slls.org. Our Baton Rouge intake line, 225-448-0331. And you can also check us out at our website. And we always refer clients to louisianalawhelp.org. There's a lot of information there. If a client is just, they just have a question to, that they won't answer uh, if they're looking for a divorce question, you can go to louisianalawhelp.org. And it's, it's so much information there, even for any individual. If you call us and you find out that you don't qualify for our services, I'm going to refer you to louisianalawhelp.org and uh, maybe to one of the other legal aid, well, not legal aid, but one of the pro bono or um, attorney uh, helplines here in Louisiana. And then um, there's LSC, that's one of our funding sources. They have information on their website, but for the most part, they're going to refer you back to us. But that's all I have. Uh, I don't know if I have time, Shalmika, but uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm open to questions. But thank you guys so much for allowing me to present today. Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. We really appreciate your presentation. I know I'm excited about this particular resource because we do know we have families that are dealing with housing instability. We have kids that are um, in foster care or we have kids that are staying with grandma on some days because their mom you know, doesn't have uh, stable living. 
And so one of the reasons why I started us off with, with the restorative practices conversation and had Ms. Brown join us was one, housing is a sensitive subject for many. So we have to navigate on how we're utilizing those restorative questions to kind of probe and understand the family we're dealing with and their issue so that we can in turn help them. And this is one way if they are sharing with us through using those questions that housing is an issue, whether it be because of eviction or an illegal eviction or anything, we have another resource to refer them to. Because again, our goal is to advocate for our families while assisting students and assisting families with addressing barriers to attendance. And we know housing instability is a barrier to attendance. So thank you so much, Ms. Brown. Did anyone have any questions that they wanted to ask her while she's on? You can unmute, I'll, uh, take two minutes to let you think about it. You can unmute and ask your question and see if she can answer it for you. Now, I do have a question. Um, if we are doing, if anyone, you know, is doing a family engagement night, would your office be open to um, having a table set up at yes, that so family course. event? Of course, just let us know the time, uh, the day and time, and we'll be there. If it's not conflicting with any other outreach or um, cases that we have going on, of course, we'd be there. Awesome. And so um, if you guys come up with any other questions, just email me. But of course, she has her email address on here as well. And of course, this, it's on the slide. So you'll get a chance to get that information when it's when the recording and the presentation is sent to you at a later date. And you feel free to ask those questions um, there or else you can send them to me and I can ask those questions for you. Uh, let's see here. Let's go straight to updates because I have some interesting things that I want us to go over. So next month is our monthly meeting. Um, we have May 4th at eight o'clock AM. You already know if that's something that I, if that's a date I need to know about to send, shoot me a quick email. But until then, that's the date we're going to go with. Um, also, I wanted to share um, the Fins Association Conference is happening in person. Like I said, I know many of you wear different hats. Um, not sure uh, who's affiliated with Fins, and that's Families in Need of in Need of Services. They've invited me to come and speak at their conference, and so I wanted to share uh, this conference with you as well because they understand our new position and how we're, we're not just focusing on truancy. And that's one of the things that I'm glad Ms. Brown shared, shared in her presentation. Yes, we're still looking at truancy data. Yes, it is still important. But as she stated in her slide, we know it's just a symptom of something greater. So we focus on chronic absence. And so that's one of the things that I'll be discussing at the FINS conference on how CWAs in Louisiana are looking more at chronic absenteeism and how we can <coughs> excuse me and how we can better use <coughs> family engagement to address those issues <coughs> oh excuse me <coughs> the next thing is of course the lack WAP <coughs> summer conference and that's june 21st to the 23rd <coughs> excuse me please visit their website to get more information. If you have not joined LACWAP, the Louisiana Association for Child Welfare and Attendance Professionals, again, that's another opportunity to network with your colleagues. Please look at joining that association. And of course, being at this summer conference, I'll be speaking there as well and offering up some, uh, I'm excited about that presentation because I've already started working on it and I'm not gonna give it out, but you gotta be there. Um, and of course, the other update <coughs> that I want you to put on your calendar, of course, is for the International Association for Truancy 
and dropout prevention. They have their annual conference and it's gonna happen October 16th through the 19th. So that's going into the next school year. And I hope that's something that we can all visit and join together and it'll be in New Orleans at the Astor Crown Plaza. Also, um, in this last minute, um, because I, I, I want to make sure that since you probably share with your, your uh, supervisors or those in your office that you're in this meeting until 930, I want you to get those last 15 minutes for your own me time if you can make it happen. But in this last minute, I did want to share one other update. Two weeks ago, I tried out for a new football team <laughs> and I made the team. And my first football game is uh, this Saturday. And so you are now looking at the Gulf Coast Monarchy's new running back. <laughs> so if you guys have not heard it today, you are absolutely appreciated. Thank you so much for the work that you do for the families in Louisiana. Thank you so much for the work you do for the students in Louisiana. You guys go out there, you make things happen. And I appreciate you for it. If, I, if you haven't heard it today, you are absolutely appreciated. I want you to go out there and continue to rock. And if you need to vent, don't go off on nobody in your office. Call me. Send me a text message and say I need to have a vent session and we can walk through the problem together because that's what I'm here for. But we can also come up with a plan of action so that you can be more effective in the work that you're doing. Again, thank you so much. You guys have a great day. Take these last 15 minutes and give them to yourself. OK, you deserve peace. You deserve time <laughs> and that's all I can give you is 15 minutes and then you got to get back to work. OK. <laughs> Thank you so much for the congratulations. Thank you. You guys are appreciated. Have a great day. Let's see here.